All of a sudden, the, the engine manufacturer says, oh, no, oh, this is, uh, I can't remember if it's ITAR restricted or whatever, but can't have some foreign citizen working on this, okay, uh, on the other side. So they had to hire me because, you know, I was a U.S. citizen and I could look at some of their documents of how they manufacture this. And sure enough, they had procedures for nitriding this and putting it into a furnace within four hours so you get rid of the hydrogen that you might get during some of the processing. It was all there, except as I'm reviewing their procedures, they wanted to do a quality control check after it had been through the procedures that could get the hydrogen in there and they would actually have uh, an exemplar in there and they would cut it off, send it out to the MET lab and they get the results back two days later. And that's when they started counting the four hours. From the day they got the MET lab results back, they would start counting the four hours. They had to get it into the furnace within four hours of getting the test lab results back, which was like two days later. I don't think that was really within the spirit of you have to put it in the furnace to get rid of the hydrogen within four hours. And so at this point I realized, and in fact, the, this helicopter and a number of others had gone down and killed people because the, sp the splines that you know held this flexible joint together had cracked. Okay, and we had looked at them and we saw hydrogen cracks um, in these things. And so at that point, I was sort of faced with a well, it wasn't really a dilemma, but I was faced with an ethical problem. As a professional engineer, I have my number one duty is for the safety of the public. It's not for who hired me, and in fact I was in litigation against the manufacturer, but the manufacturer had a defective spec, and they could kill somebody else. Well, if I went and blabbed to the FAA, well first of all it's a defense engine in this case, okay? And so I could blab to anybody I wanted, but the manufacturer could sue me and claim that I was trying to influence the litigation. So what I did is I, I, I called up the attorney I was working for and I said, look, this is defective specification. They should not be doing, if they want to do their quality control tech, test and make sure they got their hardened layer the right thickness, they got, to, they got to put it in the furnace within four hours of finishing the process, not within four hours of finishing the quality control test. Okay, that doesn't make any sense. And they're producing, and that, of course, this sort of would go to, you know, had they produced a defective part. And, but I couldn't, you know, I had to notify the manufacturer they had a problem. So I notified my attorney, I said, you've got to tell them, if you don't tell them, I will have to go to the FAA or the Defense Department or whoever and tell them. And so he contacted the other attorney and said, look, our expert says you've got a defective process and, you know, you need to fix it. Well, it turns out the other attorney just laughed, okay? He said, oh, we don't have anything defective. Uh, in the meantime, we go along and it finally goes to trial in, in Lafayette, Louisiana and stuff. I guess it maybe it wasn't a, might have been a commercial oil rig helicopter, but in any case, and we ended up winning the case and we did learn that in spite of the attorney laughing on the other side, they did go back and get some competent metallurgical expertise and they did fix it, okay? But I couldn't just sit there and read about in the paper some other person dying because these people had a defective process for removing hydrogen in their pea shooters. Um, okay, there's one other example and then we can take a break. I've mentioned the Alexander Keeland and so, whoops, what did I do? I lost it again. Uh, okay, so this is Easterling's book and in the back he has the Alexander Keeland. If you want to see what the Jack Up rig looked like, here's a picture of the Keeland. This tells you where it was built. There were a bunch of Pentagon five-legged uh, jack-up rigs, most of them working in the North Sea, built in the 1970s. This was at the French Dunkirk shipyard that they built uh, the Keelan. It was supposed to be a drilling ship, uh, so far as that goes. Um, that's what the whole thing looked, uh, looked like. And um, what's this? I don't remember. Uh, 
35 meters tall, so it's 100 feet tall. And it, I don't think it gives me, but these are like 30 foot diameter um, legs. And it's a, a semi-submersible, so it's got big pontoons. Over here at this location, right here, you actually had a cross brace. And on that cross brace, you had a little sonar flange. Uh, they called it a flange plate. And so here's the flange plate. The crack started here. It ran all the way around from here's the flange and ran all the way around this small tube. Okay, this is three feet across, three, 325 millimeter, or yeah, I think it's 325 millimeters. So this is like three feet across. You can start guessing that that's like 15 feet, and the other big leg is, is even bigger. The crack started here ran all the way around and then uh, started other fatigue cracks at other locations and a lot of these support structures failed. The thing went down in a big North Sea or, uh, storm. They look at the thing afterwards and they see fatigue, cra fatigue cracks starting from the fillet weld and here is, you can see they have a little bit of dipenetrin or something. Um, you can see a lamellar tear here, you can see a little root crack down here on the weld. This is the actual weld they dug out of the ocean. Here are some other sections. You can see a nice crack right here in this thing. Um, here's the fatigue crack. Now, you get to the hardness. Start looking at the hardness values. This is Vickers hardness, or maybe Noop, anyway. Um, doesn't say, it just says hardness, but Noop and Vickers are almost the same numbers. The bracing was 160, which is, you can't crack that stuff with hydrogen. The weld metal was like 250. Well, that's still less than 300. That's not so bad. But you start looking in the heat affected zone of the sonar flange plate, and it turns out it's 350 Rockwell C35. Not too surprising. Um, if you look at the main bracing, lots of ductility. Um, uh, Area reduction of 30, 35 percent. Uh, not specified for the flange plate. This is the this is the main bracing. This is the flange plate, um, and you can see one to seven percent area reduction, um, and lousy Sharpie energies uh, so far as that goes. And I think I told you the, the, um, a lot of things came out of that tragedy, but one of the things they they learned was that the maintenance people were responsible for making this little three foot diameter uh, pipe. And the fabrication people were, made all the braces and the, and the vertical uh, pipes and, or legs and stuff. Those people had very strict welding procedure controls. The maintenance guys, they just go in the shop, pick up a piece of steel and they didn't care. You know, and they just weld it up. They didn't have any procedures whatsoever. And so it was a little fillet weld down hidden and the interesting thing, the other interesting thing, is the sonar plate was supposed to be there for, this was supposed to be a drilling rig, and they converted it to a hotel where people were just sleeping. And it never was used for sonar or anything else. It was just sort of an appendage that had been put on, and uh, uh, they had no process controls for uh, controlling hydrogen content or hardness or anything else, okay? And with that, I guess I have one last thing which sort of relates to you. Um, it's another forging press problem, um, sort of like this, uh, which I think I can do fairly quickly. And the reason it's interesting is because it shows you what happens and how we lost our technology to weld uh, very thick steel. Um, back in, in the 1950s, when there, there was lots of money to uh, protect ourselves against the Soviet threat and stuff, the Air Force was trying to get rid of welding in their aircraft, and so they wanted bigger and bigger forging presses, and they paid to build two 50,000 ton forging presses. These were the two largest forging presses anywhere in the, what we called the free world back then, okay? The Soviets might have had a larger one, I don't know, but these two, one of them was at the Alcoa Works in Cleveland, Ohio, and now it forges aircraft parts out of aluminum and titanium and stuff. And the other one was in West Grafton, Massachusetts, out here near Worcester, about an hour and a half away. 
is a company called Wyman Gordon. Okay, and Wyman, they both had, I mean, this was back in the days of you always had redundancy, okay, in defense procurement. You always wanted to have two people, so they helped them in whatever way they did um, b build these two forging presses. So in the early 80s, the one in West Grafton developed a crack. And it developed a crack in one of the six support beams. Now this thing is a big, it's the world's largest forging press. Uh, it's big. Above ground, it's got a big uh, frame up here, but you can't make it out of a solid aluminum casting. And then it comes down, it stands maybe 80 feet above ground. And then it goes about 60 feet below ground. And you actually had some I-beams down here. You had six I-beams, if I remember. The I-beams were um, about 10 feet tall. The web was a 10-foot web. The thickness of the web was 10 inches. And the flanges, if I remember, were like uh, 15 inch thick or something. And it had developed, they had six of these going across here instead of a great big casting. These I-beams created the structure to take the 50,000 tons of force. And the U.S. Air Force was thinking about building a bigger forging press. I guess you're going to forge a whole aircraft all at once or something. Uh, and they were going to build it. The problem was you have to have a foundation to put this whole thing on, right? Um, this one was cast in concrete. Uh, you took an elevator to the bottom, okay, the six stories to the bottom if you had to get down there. Somewhat greasy after about 30 years of grease falling down through here. Um, but uh, uh, the Air Force was going to build a bigger one and they weren't going to pour a concrete foundation which might be 100 feet deep. They were going to use a mountain in Colorado. They were going to take the take the press, the, the bigger press. They ended up never building that one, uh, so far as that goes. But that, that was the plans back in the, the 1950s to build an even bigger forging press. But at this point, in the 1980s, they had a 10-foot crack in one of these beams. Six beams, couldn't use it. There were only two of these presses. It had become pretty critical for forging great big aircraft parts and, and all kinds of other things. The replacement cost of the press was estimated at $2 billion in 1980 dollars, okay? And so they were calling in a bunch of people to figure out how to re-weld this 10 foot high, 10 foot thick I-beam that had a crack all the way through. And uh, uh, so I was brought in, I actually got to take the elevator to go down to the basement of this thing and all the grease and stuff. And then the question was, can we weld it in place or are we gonna have to bring it out of here? Now to bring it out of here, there's a lot of equipment in here. It's sort of like bringing out a 40-foot beam, 10 feet in high, out of a submarine or something, if you want to think of how crowded things are. This is a lot of structure in here. They had to disassemble a lot of this, and the question, one of the questions was, A, how do we weld it? How do we get almost zero distortion? The top machine surface had to be accurate within an eighth of an inch, over like 30 feet. Okay, they actually had to machine the, the surface flat to distribute the loads evenly. And so, what's the welding procedure we should use? And can we do it in place? Well, we knew we were going to have to stress relieve it. I said, well, if you do, you're going to have to stress relieve it down six floors with all this other grease around and everything else. I said, I know it's a pain in the neck, but I, if I were you, I would rig it out of there and bring it up and have build a furnace around it so that you can stress relieve it properly and you can do the machining and everything else which is what they ended up doing but one of the problems is we didn't know how to weld 10 inch thick material without stress relieving it we had done it for hundreds of thousands if not millions of tons of armor plate in world war ii and before but in 1980 we did not have the technology Okay, we still don't have the technology. We lost that technology when a lot of people died uh, of old age. Okay, so let's take a six or seven minute break and then we'll start another topic. Uh, I think that's most of my war stories of hydrogen cracking, but it still occurs on a fairly regular basis. What's that? On a fairly regular basis. I guess it's a good, good business to do. Well, it is. <laughs> And when uh, 
when the world started deciding in the 1980s that metallurgy was passe and we didn't need metallurgists anymore and everything was going to be electronic materials, I used to tell Professor Sadaway that we would have plenty of work in our old age if they weren't going to produce metallurgists anymore. To the ship? Just barely. Yeah. So we brought them home on the ship instead of flying home. I just worked on the first time. No. Seeing the helicopter, it was kind of funny. They took the rotors off and craned it off the ship. And they actually, we were downtown in Kodiak, Alaska, about four or five miles from the air station. They brought one of the airport mules and yeah. dragged, they towed the helicopter on the city streets all the way back with the rotors off, which was quite a turn But it turned out that. It's a big helicopter. It is. Yeah. It turned out at the um, warehouse, the inventory uh, supply center in Carolina, North Carolina. Yeah. They had stamped or etched a unique identifier code onto this high speed drive shaft. And that's what started the fatigue crack? Yeah. Yeah. They, they did an actual full experiment during the investigation. They did like 50 of them. They yep. put 50 of these things through a you know, fatigue uh, simulation and they, you know, 25 cracked. of them were etched and 25 of them were yeah. and it was 100%. Every etched one cracked right. everyone. And the, first of all, it's a high strength steel, mm -hmm. right? If they etched it, they were introducing hydrogen from the etching process. The other problem people have is they went to laser scribing, where you melt the surface. Mm -hmm. Well, all they were doing is a super rapid cool mm -hmm. in a high strength steel, and they would end up with high hardness, not necessarily a hydrogen crack, but just okay. a very high hardness, and the thing would start a brittle crack, and they would start fatigue cracks. Yeah, so yeah, kind of now they, uh, um, they actually have some laser engraving techniques that don't melt the surface, okay? They just sort of, without melting the surface, you don't get to high enough temperatures to transform things and stuff. Um, but they also have a lot of things that, uh, they have a lot of different techniques now because this was sort of back in the 70s and 80s when lasers and, and, and they, you know, they had to, they actually it was also part of programs that were becoming popular then a PMI, positive materials identification, okay, and serializing parts, okay. So, so now you serialize a part and you know exactly where it came from, and so you can tell exactly why it failed. Well, in this case, it failed because you're serializing. Yep. <laughs> so, anyway, but yeah, okay. Well, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Okay, we should have the other screen coming down, but it's not in your eyes, it's just in your breakfast, right? Okay, we ready to start again? Is the thing on? Okay. Um, so, let's see, oh, I, the one thing I would say about this uh, 10 foot high beam on this last forging press, the crack started at a fillet weld where they had little blocks, the, the beam was shaped this is just sort of another little aside. If you look at the beam sideways, it was like 40 feet long, and it came down and it tapered, for whatever reason, to a bottom flange. So you had your flanges, and this is your web. In order to rig it in there, they had welded on a little 
fillet welded on a little block. I say a little block. It was a piece of steel that probably weighed about 50 pounds and it was about 10 inches square or actually was a, a 45 degree cut or whatever and they had welded it on and they decided oh, well you don't need to take that off. Well that became the stress concentration that was the beginning of the fatigue crack that caused the thing to fracture. Okay. And there's an interesting brittle fracture story here about the crack was about 10 inches long before it finally, on one of the press loadings, just ran the, the other nine feet. So that's critical flaw size. I've told you before that good steel, you could have critical flaw sizes that are pretty big. And this one, we knew the critical flaw size was uh, about 10 inches because we could see the fatigue crack grew about 10 inches from here and then ran. Um, it basically ran in a way that cut the whole two, the beam in two, okay? Um, I guess I could tell one other story, yeah. Did the crack, did, did the flange stop the crack or did it affect the flange as well? It no, the flange, it just started at the toe of the well, fillet weld. The flange was, that I mean, piece, yeah, oh. But it ran to the top. It, oh yeah, it cut, it went all the way through the flange because the flange was full penetration welded to the uh, web. Okay, so the crack ran all the way through. One of the advantages of old riveted ships is you never had a crack run further than the plate. When you would get to the rivets, the crack stops. It was the all welded construction in World War II. And before that, we always riveted ships together. And if you had a, if you had a brittle fracture, we had brittle fractures in World War I, but they only ran the length of the plate. You get to the end of the plate where the, where the plate stops and you got rivets and the crack stops. Okay, it's when you get to all welded construction that all of a sudden you can get a crack run for great distances. Um, the Titanic would not have had, it had brittle steel, but the problem was the iceberg cut through six compartments and all six of them flooded and it became, you know, heavy one end. It wasn't until the 1930s, early 1930s, that we started building critical structures of all welded construction. And the first one was the big inch pipeline from, from Louisiana up to New Jersey. It was a 30 inch diameter gas pipeline. <coughs> and it was all welded construction. First really critical thing that had been built in it. So far as I know, it was successful. It probably was taken out of service for corrosion or it just wasn't big enough. Uh, we have much bigger pipelines and higher strength pipelines now that can take more gas pressure. But uh, it was World War II when we started to go into all welded steel construction that allowed the Liberty ships. If you get a crack start, it could run all the way around the ship and split the ship in two um, because there was nothing to stop the crack. Now there have been cases, I've, I've heard of cases that there were small diameter pipelines, I don't know if they're 12 inch or whatever, where a crack would start and run for 30 miles, okay, in a buried pipeline of brittle fracture. So when, when I worked for Bethlehem Steel, they were starting to build the Alaskan pipeline and Bethlehem Steel made big diameter pipe for pipelines and there were other pipeline projects people were building in the world and the guy in the office right next to me was our pipeline expert, okay, at Bethlehem Steel. He was the one I think who told me about the 30 foot, uh, 30 mile long running crack. And they were looking at using uh, inserts in the pipelines to prevent the fractures. So every uh, couple of hundred yards, they, they were going to weld in a heavy wall, high toughness steel. So this would be your regular pipe, be your regular pipe, but they might put a 12 inch long piece that they would just weld in there that was thicker and very high toughness steel. And the type of steel they were looking at was A710 which is the same thing that was the predecessor to HSLA-80 that the Navy uses now. That was a steel that was developed by International Nickel. It had like one or two percent nickel. And um, I think I, you know, as a young mid-twenties engineer, I said, well, why don't they just build the whole thing out of A710? He says, well, first of all, you couldn't afford it with all the alloy content to get that high toughness. Um, but the, uh, the other thing, there wasn't enough nickel in the world to build a whole pipeline out of something with that high a nickel content. <coughs> well, there probably was enough nickel, but it was really the cost issue. But nonetheless, um, you do run into problems of whether you have enough material. So they actually sometimes design crack stoppers. That's what, you know, it's a crack arrester, okay? You just 
thicker, higher toughness, and if a crack starts running, um, you can stop it. Now you only get this in um, gas pipelines in general. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, because it turns out if you get a brittle fracture in a pipeline and it's carrying oil or a liquid, it turns out the, the speed of the brittle crack running is a, a substantial fraction of the speed of sound. It's like one third or one half the speed of sound that the crack is running. And if you're um, in a, if the compressed fluid that's stressing the tip of that crack is a liquid, well the speed of sound in the, uh, in the solid steel is like 5,000 feet per second. In the liquid it's like 3,000 feet per second. Okay. And so it turns out in the, uh, no, I'm sorry, it's the liquid that you can get the running crack. And the, in the liquid, I'm sorry, no, it's, it's the gas. Uh, in the liquid, you actually decompress the, if you, if you start a fracture right, if you start a fracture right here in the pipeline, the, the escaping liquid will create a pressure wave that actually can outrun the crack, so you end up relieving the stress at the tip of the running crack, okay, in a liquid pipeline. In a gas pipeline, what's the speed of sound in a gas? You know, as I remember from my high school, the speed of sound at STP is 343 meters per second, okay, or something, so a thousand feet per second, okay, in a gas. Uh, so anyway, it's a lot less than the running speed of the crack, so in a gas pipeline, the pressurizing gas is always stressing the crack tip at the full pressure. And so in a gas pipeline you can run for 30 miles, but in an oil pipeline you can't. You're actually going to stop. It's important for you Coast Guard people, right? If you're going to build gas pipelines from Alaska, you need to understand the fracture mechanics. So there's a difference between gas and oil in terms of whether you're stressing the crack tip. Uh, I won't tell you the other story. Well, maybe I will tell you the other story. Um, the other story is um, this was about uh, almost 20 years ago now, 18. I remember I was department head at the time because I remember sitting in my office getting the phone call. Up here in North Andover, they had the world's largest hot isostatic press. And the world's largest hot isostatic press was 60 inch diameter. It was a 300 ton forged vessel and it had a shape on the outside that looked like this and it was threaded top and bottom so it was I'll just leave it down here okay so they had a plug the plug weighed 50 tons this plug down here weighed 50 tons and this was a 200 ton cylinder that you put a plug top and bottom. It was 60 inch diameter here. This was 11 inches thick. This was like 17 inches thick. You had to have the, the thicker thing up here. It had been made uh, by a Japanese steel company. There's no in the United States that could make these things uh, in the 1980s. Uh, uh, but the Japanese had some of the best technology. And they a hot isostatic press is something where you fill it full of argon and you compress the argon to 20,000 psi. So this thing's going to hold 20,000 psi of argon gas, and if you start calculating that, that is approximately, you now take gaseous argon and you bring it into a state where it's almost as dense as liquid argon, okay? You're squeezing it at that pressure uh, because that's over uh, 1,000 atmospheres, like 1,300 atmospheres. In any case, you put powder parts in here, or castings, like the disc of a jet engine, okay, the rotor disc, and you want to get rid of the, the imperfections, and you heat it up to uh, 1500 degrees Fahrenheit, under 20,000 PSI, and you basically just take those pores and imperfections and you just forge them out of it. You just you isostatically squeeze the thing until everything welds back together at the temperature and in this argon gas, okay? So they had this thing, a company called IMT um, up here in North Andover, Massachusetts. Uh, 
and they had a number of these press, they, didn't, they only had one press like this. They were building another one, fortunately. Because when this thing let go, it let go with a crack right here at that stress concentration from the outside. Uh, they designed this on a supercomputer. So um, in the 1980s, the supercomputer in the mid-1980s was sort of like not quite as good as a PC of five years ago, right? Uh, uh, but they had assumed everything was not it was steady state heat flow because you have this thing's heated on the inside and you have to water cool the, the outside to keep it from getting too hot and stuff and they had this brittle fracture this top piece that let go was 16 tons and it was found a quarter mile away okay some of the people in the town of Andover were not too happy it didn't land on anybody uh, but People weren't, weren't too happy, okay, to think that they should have projectiles. One five-ton piece, this thing broke into like 70-some pieces. I had to put the, I had to reconstruct the whole fracture. One five-ton piece landed and crushed the chair of the operator. It occurred at 2 o'clock in the morning. This, this plant ran, ran three shifts a day. And he had just gotten up to change the chart paper. And he was about two or three feet away from it when the five-ton piece crushed his chair. Uh, he was sort of rattled, okay. Um, but in any case, um, this thing fractured for a number of reasons, one of which had to do with corrosion and hydrogen, okay. The critical flaw size of this steel should have been about 12 to 15 inches, okay. It was a very good nickel chrome moly vanadium, same type of steel you, you make great big generator rotors out of that are four feet in diameter and weigh 300 tons, okay? This thing weighed 200 tons, very high quality steel, supposedly, and um, water cooled jacket. Um, but what they didn't do is, it's actually not a bad example for material stress in the environment because it turns out each one of these things conspired to change the critical flaw size from about 15 inches of what it should be. You'd like it to be 15 inches so it'll actually crack all the way through and leak before it breaks. In fact, that's what we call it in fracture mechanics, leak before break. You'd like to have, in, in a submarine, will leak before it breaks in two like a Liberty ship. Okay? It's good to know, right? Uh, you can try to plug the leak. Um, and hopefully the crack won't grow very quickly or very far, uh, and that's why we like high toughness hulls for, for submarines. But the material turned out to be somewhat deficient and that they did a heat treatment on this. And typically on a big forging like this, you will have what they call a prolongation. You actually forge an extra little piece on the end of it that's part of it. You cut it off and you do all your mechanical test specimens on this prolongation. Okay, that's standard technology. Well, it turns out the first heat treatment, they measured the impact toughness and tensile strength and stuff. It didn't meet the impact toughness. The heat treatment wasn't a very good heat treatment. Uh, this is the first one they'd ever built. The only one they really ever wanted to build uh, initially, anyway. And so they decided they had to renormalize it. And so they did another heat treatment, but they didn't have a prolongation. So they just stuck a little piece in the furnace next to it and they tested that. Well, the little piece is not going to cool at the same re rate as the big piece. Duh. Okay. And so they measured the properties on this and it just barely made spec. Okay. In terms of impact toughness and strength and stuff. Um, and so they said, well, we'll assume that this is the same as that, which is not. But they at least had a, a spec, a quality control spec that they could turn into everyone else and say, see, it hit me great. Uh, so it didn't really meet spec and afterwards we actually did since the whole thing was a bunch of little pieces, we cut a piece out of here because this piece had never been heated. The furnace was up in here and the thing was 15 years old, but it had never been, this part had never been heated. And so this still had the original properties and we found it still didn't meet spec. This little piece may have met spec, but that one didn't, okay? So the material was deficient. You can shrink this circle. The stress, well, they had calculated the stresses at steady state when this thing was operating. And in steady state when this thing is operating, um, you should actually have your maximum stress, your tensile stress, on the inside 
depending on where the heat zone is, but it was out on the inside. In fact, the crack had started on the outside, and I remember coming back from that first day uh, of going up there to, or actually the second day when I actually got to see, see the piece. Uh, I went back and told our administrative officer, I said, beware of the transient thermal stresses. This thing had been heating up for about an hour and a half, and something this thick, when you go through my fusion welding course, I'll tell you how to calculate through the, the Einstein formula the rate of heating, but this was still in the transient. It was still being heated through the thickness. And it turns out that was going to create tensile residual stresses on the outside right at that location because that's a stress concentration. So you can shrink or you can increase. The material had worse properties, so you can increase the size of the material. The stress was larger, so you can increase the size of that. And the last thing is they had the world's largest water treatment company developing the water chemistry control for the cooling water on the outside of this and they were using phosphates and it turns out it was corroding the whole thing they went and looked at a, uh, a sister thing that had the same stuff and it looked like a, uh, a Dalmatian with all these corrosion pits all over the surface from the water chemistry so you can take your environment and blow that up and so all of a sudden you have hydrogen brittlement stre stress corrosion cracking. The critical flaw size dropped from 15 inches about to I measured half an inch. It had a fatigue crack in here half an inch long. That was the initiating crack that caused the whole thing to blow up. Okay. Fortunately, to, or to get a new one would take about three years lead time. And every large aircraft engine in the you know, Western world had to go through this furnace. Uh, and so we would have had a problem. Pratt & Whitney, General Electric, Rolls-Royce would have had to quit making aircraft engines for Boeing and people like that. Except they had another one